Okay. So I think uh, probably uh, people will keep on joining uh, in the next couple of minutes. So um, I wanted to start off with a quick question um, and you can answer by yes and no writing in the, by writing yes or no in the chat. So I wanted to ask you if you, let's see. So while we're waiting for the others, this is an image from um, a tra train derailment accident which happened around mid-February in Ohio, East Palestine. I wanted to ask you uh, if you have heard about this news to write yes in the chat and also to write the media where you found out about it. And if you uh, haven't heard about it, you write no, basically. So, uh, so the question is, uh, the image that you are probably uh, seeing on the screen from um, uh, from a train derailment accident which caused an explosion in East Palestine, Ohio from February, from mid-February this year, of this year. The question is whether uh, you are familiar with the accident, uh, yes or no. If yes, to also write down which media source you found out about it from. Okay, you can't hear anything. Someone can't hear anything, it's too low. No, no, no. So, Instagram, Facebook, Angela, Twitter. No, 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 no. Yes, Azra. Azra, can you please write where, which media uh, you 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 um, on which media you found out about this accident? Yeah, it's interesting. Majority of people haven't heard about it. Okay, sorry, didn't didn't see. Maybe it was uh, yes, and then Twitter. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I also I also heard about it on Twitter, and then I tried researching more um, today, and it's not so easy. There aren't that many sources. I, I shared a couple on the forum, so if, if you're interested to learn more about it. Um, okay, TV News Croatia. Great. Uh, yeah, it actually happened. Uh, and you can, I mean, as I just said, I've posted two links on the forum. One is a YouTube video uh, produced by Glenn Greenwald and his um, his production team, and the other one is a is a Guardian article analyzing the development. So, um, and this image it became quite famous uh, on Twitter. I I also found out about Twitter on Twitter. Uh, it, it, it's, it wasn't very well covered on media and the Twitter discussion only appeared a couple of days after the accident. Yeah, exactly. So the, the links I sent you are not conspiracy theories, uh, they are legitimate sources, so you can consult them if you're interested to more about it. So um, I think it's five past now, most people probably um, have joined. Mm. So I'll go back to the first slide, just to say that today we will be talking about environmental risk communication. Uh, and this will be the last uh, lecture. Um, I, I, it will be the last lecture from the course on uh, communicating in an age of ecological crisis. Um, the image I shared, And also the links I uh, I followed uh, the, the links I sent on the forum 
uh, I, I describe this as an example of a, of a really terrible uh, environmental risk communication. So what, how not to do environmental risk communication is the uh, East Palestine, Ohio accident. So, um, and we will talk um, during this lecture a little bit more about what environmental risk communication is, what it isn't, what are its key elements, uh, what are sort of the evolving and changing trends in, uh, in the uh, global environmental and uh, communication atmosphere, which is making this especially relevant. Uh, and also then in the second half, we will be looking at some examples of uh, effective or successful environmental risk campaigns, communication campaigns, and then some examples of uh, ineffective or uh, unsuccessful uh, environmental risk communication campaigns. Um, and hopefully the talking part, the part where I'm talking to myself, hopefully not. Uh, so the, uh, I don't like this unidirectional uh, uh, communication, but it, it is what it is. So uh, I will try to uh, get through the presentation as fast as possible so that we have more time for the discussion um, afterwards. Uh, so that's where uh, I feel that's the most interesting for me and I think it's probably also more interesting for you because it's not just you know dry uh, uh, one-sided talk by a person on the other side of the screen so but let's start with that part uh, so uh, let's start with definitions what is environmental risk communication so uh, as you can imagine it, it is a combination of uh, of uh, communicating about risk and communicating about environmental risk. Um, whereas for other topics that were discussed in the previous week weeks and that will be discussed in uh, upcoming weeks as part of this course, uh, most of the content uh, that you will be able to find on environmental risk communication <clears throat> doesn't come from academic sources. So there isn't really that much academic literature on environmental risk communication. Most of it comes from policies or from an international organization like or the international organizations like the World Health Organization um, or environmental protection agency. So they are the ones that uh, draft and write policy recommendations and papers about how environmental risk should be communicated or how it can be communicated. And the academic literature is uh, a, a, a little bit uh, lagging behind on this, but, uh, you know, as the topic becomes uh, more and more relevant with the uh, uh, climate change becoming more prevalent and its symptoms, we will be seeing more in the academic literature as well. So uh, the main definitions, how they, I, I, I put their examples of two definitions, they're quite similar. One is by the Environmental Protection Agency, the other one is by the World Health Organization. So the first one defines environmental risk communication as that communication which is intended to provide um, a general or specific audience with the information they need to make informed, independent judgments about risks to their health, safety, and the environment. Uh, so the focus is on uh, providing information that allows to make uh, informed, independent judgments. So it's not, uh, let's say, pushing or pressuring for, for, the, for the public to take certain decisions. It's a, a democratic process where you provide information and then the, uh, the population makes uh, the decisions um, by themselves. The second definition, similarly, um, it, make, it places a focus on the real-time exchange of information, so on the advice uh, and opinions between experts or officials and, and people. Uh, uh, with regards to uh, uh, facing a, a threat or a hazard to their survival, health, or economic or social well-being. So its ultimate purpose is that everyone at risk will be able to make informed decisions, again, focus on informed decisions to mitigate the effects of the threat, hazard, 
uh, which can take any different uh, form. So, uh, environmental risk communication it stands at the intersection of several di different disciplines. So, we have risk management on the one hand, uh, risk management and mitigation, which is more technical and scientific. Then we have health promotion uh, on the other side, uh, crisis communication, media studies, and media and 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 communication in general and environmental risk communication uh, brings all of this together or it should be bring if it is to be effective it should be bringing all of these various aspects together um, um, in many ways it is uh, it, it is doing what this course is trying to do which is uh, to combine technical um, scientific knowledge uh, or expertise on the environment with communication about the environment so um, these are the. Uh, this is the context in which uh, effective environmental risk communication should be embedded. Now, uh, what the risk uh, environmental risk communication uh, is often confused, uh, or it is taken to mean uh, crisis communication. They are very similar and there are overlaps, but they are not identical terms. Um, why are they uh, closely related but not identical? First is because if a risk is not managed well, it can lead to a crisis. Uh, and uh, risk uh, communication in crisis such as uh, environmental hazards are a key focus of uh, risk communication. However, crisis communication more often than not focuses on the reputational risks of specific crisis. And when we talk about crisis communication, we think about how to respond to a specific crisis that affects uh, a company or, um, uh, or, 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 or an institution in order to mitigate the, the negative impacts uh, of that crisis on the organization or on the institution. Whereas risk communication serves to achieve different objectives, uh, which are public, which are re relate to the definitions um, I uh, mentioned um, previously. So they are very closely related, uh, but they are not uh, identical. Uh, examples of environmental uh, risk uh, communication uh, in in environmental risks in general. So, uh, environmental risk, uh, the first uh, the first image we may get, it, it might be um, a hazard of some sort, an oil spill uh, or something along those lines. However, it entails various sorts of risks and hazards that can be technological, environmental, so societal, uh, health risks. And it can refer to both acute risks such as industrial accidents that can happen uh, without any warning or without any uh, any sort of expectation and but they can also be chronic risks such as air pollution so from from the side of the more acute risks we we can think of oil um, oil tanker and chemical spills explosions and fires nuclear power plant accidents leaks uh, of toxins into water uh, and then in terms of more chronic risks, we look at air pollution and climate change related events come somewhere in between. Uh, chronic risks that are um, uh, that pertain to climate change as such, but we, but which uh, which have acute implications or acute repercussions in in different uh, uh, geographic settings. Uh, so, uh, there are various uh, forms in which information uh, about risks can be shared uh, and they can, I mean, uh, it's quite similar uh, as with usual communication campaigns. So uh, all, the diff all the same channels are, uh, are, are used, but with, uh, with, a, with a different caution and attention to the to the uh, to the risk factor, to the implications that not taking that risk into account can bring. So there are two approaches to environmental risk communication. There is the traditional one-way technical model of risk communication, and that involves a technical person from science or um, 
that communicates um, about a specific risk that is uh, either chronic or acute. And um, this is the one-way technical model, which doesn't involve a feedback loop between what is communicated, who is receiving the message, and what is the feedback mechanism between the two. This is no longer uh, considered to be a, a, a good model of uh, environmental risk communication. Now, the encouraged model is the interactive the logic uh, cultural model of risk communication, and it involves the real-time exchange of information between experts, organizations, and risk recipients. So when we, uh, this phrase risk recipients refers to anyone who is exposed to the risk, and it depends on the environmental risk uh, communication campaign, uh, which would be the categories that fall under this risk recipient phrase. And the interactive dialogical model aims to ensure, again, uh, going back to the definition, that the people at risk can take informed decisions to mitigate the effects of the uh, uh, respective threats from that uh, um, environmental risk. Now, uh, on the right-hand side, you will be able to see this, um, let's say, integrated system of, uh, of an interactive dialogical model of risk communication. So it starts at, at, and it includes all the various aspects that should be, uh, should be taken into consideration when building uh, a strategy for communicating about environmental risk. So on the, on the uh, top, we have the risk communication systems and they, uh, this is, uh, what would have to be prepared in anticipation for any risk? So any institution or any company, uh, this is, let's, let's say, the preparatory phase that they would need to go through in order to uh, be ready for any potential crisis that may occur. So it, in, it includes having a, a strategy in case of a risk, then having standard operating procedure of how to deal with uh, the specific risk, how to respond, how to coordinate internally, etc. And then uh, it, it might also involve some simulation, uh, either about the specific risk um, that has indeed occurred or some risk that there is a chance to occur uh, and that is somehow related to the specific institution or the company. So this is the starting point, the preparation. Then there is, uh, once the risk has occurred, there is an, uh, the important uh, element is um, the internal and partner communication and coordination. So the coordination and communication that occurs both inside the institution itself that will be uh, creating the environmental risk uh, communication or campaign, uh, as well as their communication with external partners. So not always the, the institution will have the scientific know-how to uh, build, uh, let's say, the messages about the specific environmental risk and uh, the, the threats it poses to human health or to, to, the environments, to the environment. So it will be important to communicate and to coordinate with all these different partners uh, that are relevant about a specific situation and to do it in a timely manner uh, in order to be effective and, and in order to be uh, quick uh, with responding to, to a specific risk. And it is important to maintain a good communication on the various levels between international, national and local levels, depending on, uh, on the extent uh, and the, the, depending on the geographic extent of the risk and of the specific uh, environmental um, hazard, let's say. Then the next, uh, the next uh, part is the public communication. So once <clears throat> in cooperation with uh, partners and different uh, stakeholders, it, it's been established what is the best, best method to respond uh, and to inform the public about mitigating the risks that come from a specific environmental uh, situation. Then there is the public communication uh, uh, step, which involves social mobilization, social media, media campaigns. So this is where we start talking about communicating to the public. Um, then uh, we, we uh, think about a more targeted approach of communication, uh, where uh, there is an engagement with communities at risk, 
So, uh, and uh, here it's not so, um, uh, it, 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 it's a more vertical approach where influencers and peer-to-peer -peer networks are employed to uh, send a message directly to the targeted communities, the, the communities that are most at risk. And finally, as part of this, uh, let's say, feedback loop, uh, of this integrated system, we have the dynamic listening and rumor management. So you don't only send the message either through public communication or through these influencer peer-to-peer -peer networks, but you, uh, you also listen to uh, how these messages are received. Uh, are there any rumors? Are there any other intervening variables or uh, interpretations of the event online or uh, in other sort of platforms of social interaction. And then this feeds back into the loop. So um, that's why this is a dialogical um, interactive model, because every single, uh, and ideally every single uh, part uh, of this chain uh, has a relationship to everyone before, and it should be constantly evolved, um, and it should be uh, adapted in order um, to respond to the changing situation and to respond to the changing uh, uh, expectations and fears uh, of the public. And it is a, definitely a very compli complicated uh, process. Although in many ways this is uh, or how you would usually perform, let's say, a communications campaign because uh, it, it, uh, the timeline is usually uh, shorter and because the risks are higher and the, uh, the risks for the public and for the environment are higher, uh, uh, this makes it all the more important to follow all of these steps, but also all the more challenging also. So, um, what are the prerequisites for making sure that this sort of integrated system is possible? First of all, because uh, it requires uh, so many different elements to fit together, it requires political will. So first of all, uh, the, the, main, uh, the, the main prerequisite is to have the political will that it is important to respond to a specific environmental risk, that it is important not to ignore it. More often than not, especially um, I mean, uh, the, the first example I showed uh, is, a, is a flagrant example of, uh, of uh, uh, the authorities choosing to ignore um, a specific environmental risk. But this also happens in the region, where because there is the lack of political will, you wouldn't find um, uh, responses to specific en environmental really risky situations. So uh, where there is political will, there will be a national, regional, local objective set. There would be uh, specific authorities uh, put in charge of, of, of a specific environmental uh, risk campaign. And there would be sp specific standard operating procedures uh, put in place in order to address it. And there would be specific finances and resources allocated to the campaign, uh, to the communication and uh, technological and informational systems. So you need these not, not only for the, you need these for two uh, reasons. First, to, to track the development of the risk. So let's say it was a chemical spill. So you need the technology and informational systems to understand how the risk is evolving and how, uh, how the risk to health and the environment is changing. But you also need the technological and informational systems to be constantly communicating to the public uh, in an informed uh, manner uh, about the, uh, the precautions they need to take. Um, so, um, it, emergency in, in, in emergency risk communication it, it's a spelling mistake it should be environmental risk communication so why uh, why is it important uh, first of all it is it is important in order to provide an overall vision mission and direction for all the phases of an emergency of an environmental emergency so to be able to anticipate um, uh, a risk to be able to be ready to respond when it occurs to have uh, an appropriate response and to have a, a, a good recovery strategy after the risk has occurred. So uh, the aim is to provide for a coherent direction, coordination and allocation of the resources. So uh, when developing a risk communication strategy, 
environmental risk communication strategy. Uh, again, it would be a similar appro approach you would follow as uh, with other types of communication strategies, but uh, with, the, um, with, with the risk factor um, calling for extra caution and extra attention and extra care for this uh, dialogical um, interactive model in, in communication. So you would start with identifying what is the challenge, what is the specific communication challenge that arises out of the specific environmental risk. Who are the stakeholders? So who are the different stakeholders you, that you will be communicating to define the risk? And who are the stakeholders that are um, affected by the specific risk? What is the end goal of the campaign? What do you, what is the what uh, what does this uh, communi risk communication strategy try to achieve? Uh, does it try to mitigate the risk? Does it try to uh, mitigate the risk at a specific in a specific area for a specific population? Does it want to focus more on the health aspects, uh, more on the environmental aspects? What um, then? What activities need to happen and in which priority? Because uh, especially with when it comes to acute uh, environmental risks. Um, the timeline is very brief and uh, it is necessary to act quite swiftly. Um, it is important to set out uh, the priorities, uh, uh, the uh, order of activities that need to happen in an order of priority. And then uh, it's important to be aware of the resources that are necessary to uh, put the strategy in, in uh, to implement the strategy. So principles for best practice, um, and this is uh, these are important for the assignment because um, the assignment focuses on uh, kind of uh, making sure that the uh, environmental risk campaign uh, takes into account at least some of these principles. So transparency refers to, and we will, uh, I mean, we will look at all of these specific ones through the um, practical example, um, but I will just outline them very briefly. So the principles for best practice in environmental risk communication. It's important that uh, the communication is transparent, that uh, it is open, and uh, 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 if the institution or the company is uncertain about certain uh, uh, facts or aspects about the environmental risk, it's important to communicate this to the public. Um, then it is important to be clear, to, be, to, to have clarity about the message that is being sent, to not be confusing by using overly scientific uh, language and tone. Then it is important for the communication to be relevant, to be relevant to the concerns of the public and to be relevant to the specific uh, concerns that arise out of the specific risk. Then it's important to be timely, obviously, to respond uh, uh, relatively quickly uh, to the uh, to, to inform the public about how they should uh, respond to the specific uh, situation. And um, with the example I shared. Uh, this was definitely not the case. I mean, many of the other aspects were not uh, were not uh, there, but timeliness was definitely not there. There was no uh, the authorities were very slow to respond uh, to the public about what actually went on in East Palestine with the with the train derailment and the chemical spill. Then the credibility of the message and the credibility of the source that is sending the message. Uh, responsiveness, to be responsive, uh, to be uh, in contact and dialogue with the public. So if you notice that there is something uh, that the messages are a bit off or that they are not really responding to the specific concerns at the time to, uh, to, um, uh, to adapt the messages to this. Then consistency, to make sure that the various uh, subjects that are communicating about a specific environmental risk are sending a consistent message throughout so that there isn't one authority that is saying uh, this is uh, very hazardous and another authority to be saying uh, this is uh, this is not a huge risk to public health and for the messages to be accessible. So, uh, I mean, it, uh, um, these are 
a bit theoretical now when we look at the specific examples. Uh, by looking at specific situations on uh, environmental miscommunication, it will be it will become clearer. Uh, but there are anyways quite intuitive and common Um So let me check chat. Okay, um, maybe we'll answer. I'll answer these afterwards. Uh, what an environmental risk communication strategy cannot do. So while it's important to um, to let's say account for all the uh, all the aspects that a communication strategy on environmental risk can do, it's also important to be aware of where it where is its limit. So environmental risk communication strategy cannot communicate its way out of problems created by bad risk assessment and risk management. So a, a good communications team cannot uh, create a good communications campaign if there is a bad risk assessment and bad risk management. So um, th the key message here is that there should be a very good interaction and very good synergy between communicators and scientists and those that conduct risk assessments and risk management. When, the, the, when there is, uh, when this relationship is broken, and especially when there is no good basis in risk assessment and risk management, actually a good communication strategy, uh, first of all, it cannot be good, but it can be, actually, it can be deceptive for the public. It can just uh, uh, serve to distract the attention away from the responsibility of specific authorities. And it, it finally will not um, achieve its uh, end, end goal, which is to prevent the risks for the public and for the environment. <clears throat> and conversely, however, a bad environmental risk communication strategy can undermine good risk assessment and management. So even if there is a really good uh, risk assessment uh, in place, so very good, uh, uh, let's say, uh, advice and recommendations put in put forward by scientists and technical personnel. When the communication strategy is bad, it can undermine um, it can undermine the messaging and it can undermine the campaign because it can, in various ways, by creating confusion uh, amongst the public, by um, uh, distorting the message, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they are uh, in, in with regards to environmental risk communication. The key, uh, the key uh, take is that it should always be taken in close uh, co co correlation with uh, risk assessment and risk management with science. But not, one is not more important than the other. They should go together in order to be effective. So what are the mega trends to be thinking about when, uh, when devising environmental risk um, communications and that are affecting how you respond to uh, environmental risks nowadays. So uh, risks themselves because of climate change and because of a range of uh, other environmental uh, uh, concerns um, is uh, the environment is increasingly complex and uh, risks are cross border so there are you cannot limit them to a local national uh, uh, context uh, but they require an international response um, this is especially the case with let's say with many examples uh, environmental examples and also pandemics so they require uh, they require international efforts to respond to them uh, then uh, another mega trend um, is the declining trust in experts and authorities. So uh, this is especially challenging when, when communicating uh, uh, about risk uh, and, and it is a, uh, a challenge for all uh, communicators and authorities. Uh, then the other mega trend is the move away from one way to two and uh, multi-directional uh, communication. Uh, this is obviously a challenge for any type of communication and all the more so for risk communication. Uh, and then there is the loss of influence of traditional media and the fragmentation of channels. Again, a challenge for uh, every type of communication as well as risk communication. 
and then the rise of fake news infodemics. So all of these factors combined make this integrated system quite challenging and uh, make uh, in environmental risk communication a very, uh, very, very challenging endeavor. But also a very important one in the context of uh, uh, having uh, more and more environmental risks uh, in the region and globally. So the challenges to environmental risk communication, they can come from the very from different sources. So they can come from the level of the sender of the message, so from the communicator. They can come from the message itself, from the channel through which it's communicated, uh, through the noise that surrounds the message. Uh, they, they can come from the receiver itself, from the context and from the feedback. And uh, for instance, uh, examples of how each of these appear under the various categories. So. Uh, 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 the challenges pertaining to the senders. There can be expert disagreement with regards to specific uh, environmental or, or health uh, or social uh, repercussions of a specific environmental risk. Uh, and then this confuses uh, the, the all the all the other steps of the of the communication. Then there, are, there can be different interests, so that also confuses uh, the process. Then the, the message, uh, the message when it's too complex or overly technical, uh, it can also confuse the, the, the cycle. Oh, you, you cannot see the slide? Okay, I can see it. Uh, anyway, so I'll... Um, this is just to show that from uh, all the different layers of uh, of the of the environmental risk uh, cycle, there are communicate there are communication challenges. Uh, and if it's blurry, I will skip it, and then I will send it to you so you can. Oh, you can see. Okay. Anyways, I will send you the I will send you the presentation afterwards. And now in the next part, uh, we will go through examples of successful and unsuccessful environmental risk communication. But before that, I will look at the chat because I wasn't following. The slides are not are moving. Okay. Okay. What are the main tools for rumor management? So. Uh, uh, good question. Uh, rumor management. Uh, first, listening, monitoring the rumor by tracking uh, online uh, discussions, how certain messages are received online. And then if uh, ideally you would mix that method with not only online methods, but also other, other types of methods. So you can do, for instance, uh, uh, you, you can employ types of, let's say, anthropological methods of um, uh, researching how specific communities uh, are responding to a message. So, uh, scientifically sending a researcher to check, asking questions, what do you think about this, as, as types of focus groups. So, uh, I mean, this is usually uh, dependent on the resources and the speed with which you need to respond to a specific situation. Uh, and that's why in, in certain ways online online media and online platforms both complicated, they create the, the, the space for rumors, but they also create the tools to be listening uh, uh, on what is happening about rumors. So usually what you would you would have one person responsible for following um, following the trends of discussion online and then creating some sort of a report about the key messages, what are the negative, what are the positive messages that appear, and then uh, and then uh, tailoring a specific response to each of them. First of all, um, uh, first of all, uh, thinking about what's the best uh, approach and then responding adequately. Rumor tracking, yeah. 
actually pandemics has shown how not including communion not, can be ineffective. Yeah, exactly. Pan the pandemic is a, I mean, it appears all over the literature. Um, and uh, and the pandemic, if it has shown anything, is that when communicating about specific uh, critical situations, it's important to understand to include communication professionals. It, even then, you might not be able to achieve the desired results, but at least you're you're reducing the uh, you're reducing the negative uh, the the potential for negative, let's say, feedback. Okay, so um, now uh, what I wanted us to do is go through the examples, to go through some examples of successful environmental risk communication. And the examples of successful environmental risk communication come from uh, the WHO. And then we can discuss what are the, the sort of similarities and differences between the successful and the unsuccessful examples. So whereas the examples of successful communication are from the WHO, the other, the unsuccessful examples are, uh, you know, I, I came up with them based on, uh, you know, some um, recent uh, environmental risk examples. So the case study one is uh, uh, about promoting indoor air quality in schools in Hungary. And the second case study is uh, water contamination in Veneto, Italy. So uh, whereas the first one can be, let's say, a more of a chronic example of a chronic environmental risk, the second one is an example of a more acute. So a more, let's say, short term problem that occurred. And uh, we can you can I will go through each of these examples and you can agree or disagree uh, as to whether these are examples of good um, uh, uh, communication campaigns. So the case study from Hungary, uh, it was uh, about promoting indoor air quality in schools. Uh, the institution responsible for implementing this campaign was the National Public Health Center. Uh, it's an institution that, that is responsible for indoor and outdoor pollution in Hungary. And uh, uh, they conducted the campaign under the In Air Q project, which is a project that was funded throughout the region of Central uh, and Eastern Europe. Uh, I think it involved five or six countries and it's funded by Interreg Central Europe. Maybe some of you are aware of this organization, I wasn't. Uh, so the timeline was between 2017 and 2019. Uh, the focus was primary schools in Hungary. Um, the scope uh, of the action of the campaign was 16 primary schools and their aim was to raise awareness of air pollution indoors and outdoors and to suggest achievable behavior changes and to target policymakers in order to instigate policy change. Uh, it's considered uh, an example of an effective communications campaign uh, because the messages identified during the monitoring campaign uh, uh, were considered to be in line with the uh, with the uh, with the demands of the specific uh, social uh, context. Uh, then the communication campaign was devised in dialogue with uh, uh, with scientific researchers and the communications team. So these are. Uh, taken as uh, features of a, of, a, of a positive, successful communication campaign. And uh, the results were uh, the issuance or of, of five national action plans, so not only in Hungary, but also in, in uh, surrounding countries, and protocols for clean uh, indoor air. Uh, now, I mean, the actual actions that resulted from this include uh, like regular uh, regular uh, ventilation of the air, uh, making sure that uh, there are trees in the surrounding area of the school. But um, what I, my personal criticism of this specific example was that for instance, it wouldn't work or it wouldn't work as well or as easily 
uh, in a context like, Scop like Skopje, where it's so where it is so polluted. So you would require uh, like air uh, purifiers in schools. It wouldn't be enough to just ventilate because air air outside is so polluted. So the actions, even if you even if you identify specific messages or specific uh, contextual uh, challenges, uh, environmental risks, you might not be able to respond. Uh, you might not be able to respond effectively. So the challenge is not as high, and that may be re the reason why it's, it's a successful communication campaign. And the, maybe the risk also, it corresponds to a lower risk, and that's why it appears maybe as a good communication campaign. Any furniture chemicals control in a Hungary cam uh, campaign? I, I don't think so. I mean, uh, I think that there was... Uh, for, oh, you mean, yeah, yeah, uh, furniture chemicals, I'm not sure, but definitely uh, cleaning products. So um, there was... a. Um, uh, there were protocols in the protocols. They listed that if you're using specific products, cleaning products in these primary schools, they should be green, they should be clean, environmentally friendly, and good for the health of the children. So uh, they did create these specific protocols, and for for um, for the timeline of the of the campaign, it, um, uh, they took the various. Uh, they took into account the various aspects responsible for the indoor pollution. So the campaign started uh, started off by monitoring uh, the levels of pollution, indoor pollution, and then uh, determining. So for the monitoring, you have you had scientific teams responsible for this, so measuring the indoor pollution, and then responsible for the origins of the indoor pollution, and then based on that, they devised the they, they devised the proposals for the protocols. But again, uh, this is a specific context where the risk is not as high as in many many cities across uh, uh, across our region. Case study two: what water contamination in Veneto, Italy? So he, this is a let's say a higher level of risk. Um, the issue was uh, PFAS uh, water contamination in the Veneto region, which uh, extended for 200 kilometers squared, uh, and it affected uh, three, uh, 300, uh, 350,000 people. And the institution responsible for uh, dealing with this environmental risk was the Regional Environmental Protection Agency in the period 2013-2014. Uh, their aim was to communicate about water contamination, the risk to the population, and the measures that the authorities, local and nationals, and national have taken to respond to the water contamination. Um, and the communication campaign involved national and local, uh, uh, a combination of a no national and a local campaign, combining scientists and communicators. The results, the results demonstrate that both uh, prior to the start of the campaign, and as a result of the campaign, there was a political will on the level of the local authorities and national authorities to respond to the specific situation. So there was the uh, urgent installation of carbon filters by the water service providers in the homes in the affected area. There was the identification of the sources responsible. So this is in the north part of Italy where there is industry, there is textile, there is automobile industry. So uh, they identified the sources responsible, they increased water monitoring, and they fitted uh, carbon filters on water treatment plants. Uh, 17,000 location contaminated with 3,000 hotspots in Europe. Okay, so uh, I mean, we can. Uh, this, these are the examples of successful environmental risk communication given by the World Health Organization. Uh, I'm not sure if you agree. If these are examples of successful water, con uh, like for instance, this second example. I'm not sure if, if it really. My concern would be what I would check is whether you, by installing filters, you're you're mitigating against the risk entirely. 
uh, whether it is filters on water service providers or on water water treatment plants, and you're but you're not really uh, you're not really dealing with the source of the problem. So um, there is still P PFAS pollution and water contamination in the area. You're just trying to purify the water afterwards. So uh, I mean, the, the general idea was that. They tested the water afterwards and they provided information to the public that it is safe to drink uh, after all these measures were taken. But I, uh, I, I would say there are still concerns with the specific approach taken. But these are the, uh, the examples given by the World Health Organization. And they outlined that uh, there are certain common features of all good practices of effective environmental risk communication. Uh, and these are as follows. So the messaging reflects the concerns of the public and recognizes their diversity. So diversity in terms of, let's say, uh, economic, social background, ethnical background, uh, educational background. Then uh, secondly, uh, it is important to select and manage the appropriate channels to reach and reassure the public. Then to understand who has influence on the public and optimizing it. So when locating influencers and peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, that can be useful for the communication. Then involving the public and stakeholders early on and adopting two-way and multi-directional communication. So um, this is outlined um, uh, frequently. Uh, then measuring uh, measuring uh, the risk communication to understand the progress, so the uh, rumor mitigation, uh, listen, uh, the listening, uh, uh, understanding how the how the the risk communication goes, and, and adapting it accordingly is also an important aspect. Uh, then uh, it is it is important to to have a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, it requires capacity building uh, uh, on all levels of communication. And the messages uh, require emotions and compassion to counter rate outrage, to understand uh, the, the real concerns of the affected populations, to recognize that uncertainty is manageable uh, for uh, risk communication and that risk communication should be embedded within scientific outsets from the outset. So, uh, how about examples of failed environmental risk communication or um, ineffective or unsuccessful environmental risk communication? Uh, two case studies. Uh, they're not from our region, but uh, I mean, you can, uh, while we are going through these examples, maybe you can start thinking already about examples of specific environmental risks because it would be relevant for the assignment. And the way that um, th these case studies are outlined is also very useful for your assignment. So the first case study is from Japan uh, and the second one is from the Iowa train derailment and oil spill from 2018. So uh, case study one, nuclear power is safe. This was the title of the campaign in Japan. Uh, it was launched in 2011, immediately, very short time span uh, after the Fukushima nuclear disaster happened. Its aim was to reassure the public about the safety of nuclear power. And uh, here are the main uh, elements of a, uh, of a if effective and a successful environmental risk communication, transparency, clarity, relevance, timeliness, credibility, responsiveness, consistency, accessibility. Let's see how this nuclear power is safe campaign fared with regards to each of these aspects. So when, in terms of transparency, the campaign, uh, it was not clear who was funding the campaign, which was the organization behind it, which were the companies behind it, and these, uh, this uh, raised suspicions amongst the public um, uh, as to the possibility of having different interests at play that do not have the, the public uh, interest in mind solely, but maybe are in different interests are interfering. Uh, then, in terms of the clarity, 
uh, it was not, the messaging wasn't clear. It, uh, it used the technical jargon. Um, in terms of the relevance, again, the campaign failed um, uh, in this regard as well. It appeared to be downplay downplaying the risks and dismissing the fears of the public. And this took place relatively soon after the Fukushima disaster, so it wasn't timely. Uh, they started talking about the safety of nuclear power uh, 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 before the full extent of the damage and all the risks involved were known. Uh, then uh, credibility. Uh, the campaign was seen as biased and self-serving. And one of the reasons for this was the perce perception of a close relationship between the government and the nuclear industry in the country. So uh, the um, credibility of the campaign was also uh, affected. Uh, in terms of the responsiveness, the campaign was viewed as not responsive to the concerns of the public, appeared to be more interested in promoting nuclear power than addressing the risks and concerns to health and to the environment of the Japanese people. And the campaign was not consistent in its messaging. Uh, different uh, government agencies and industry groups provided conflicting information. It was, uh, uh, and finally, the campaign was not accessible. It was primarily targeted at those with technical knowledge or an interest in nuclear power. Everyone else was not really able to understand um, uh, it, it, to, to not really access the message, the messages or the end goals of the campaign. Case study two. So Iowa train derailment and oil spill from 2018. This is a very similar example to what I showed you at the very start uh, in Ohio. Uh, so, and actually train derailment seemed to be a very frequent occurrence in the United States these days. Two days ago, actually, there was another train derailment and it caused another uh, accident, but it wasn't such a major one. Uh, in the, the case uh, on the slide, discussed on this slide, we, uh, what happened was that in 2018, uh, a train derailed from the tracks, it crashed, and as a result, two, 230,000 gallons of oil spilled into, uh, into floodwaters in Iowa. Um, it again, uh, similarly as in the case with Japan, um, the authorities failed on all accounts of, uh, of environmental risk communication, so they, they, they didn't make sure their campaign was not transparent, they didn't actually have a campaign at all. The company responsible for the spill um, did not disclose the full extent of the damage and was slow to release information to the public. The authorities also did not um, take any proactive action to communicate about the spill and its uh, risks. Um, then the, uh, what we are seeing here is, uh, again, the importance of political will, uh, especially when it comes to transparency. So political will is the number one factor that is uh, the prerequisite to start any sort of environmental risk uh, communication. Absent political will, it will not happen. There will be uh, either a company communicating about specific uh, environmental risk or it will be... Uh, uh, the approach would be to ignore the situation and try to uh, try to remove it from the media. So the other extreme from transparent, complete darkness. Uh, then uh, clarity with regards to the Iowa train uh, derailment situation. The information provided was too technical when it was available and it wasn't very frequently available. And the public were not was not provided with clear instructions on how to protect themselves or what steps they need to take if they were exposed to the oil. So the authorities completely failed. Um, the messages provided by the company did not address the potential health risks the focus instead was on the cleanup process and restoring the pipeline, so the messages were not relevant. Uh, the uh, timeliness, the company did not, did not notify the public immediately, the company nor the authorities. Both failed uh, in terms of notifying the public about the uh, 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 spill, which meant that the public was uh, not aware of the potential risks and they had to uh, learn about it from uh, informal sources or from uh, uh, socializing with their with their fellow citizens. 
the company responsible uh, responsible for this spill was not very did not have a good record of credibility because they had a, a past examples of poor safety which led to skepticism and doubt about amongst the public which means that they were not the right subject to be sending the the message to be communicating about the environmental risk and uh, the authorities failed in this regard because they relied on the company's information without independent verification which further undermined the credibility of the process and the credibility of the authorities. Responsiveness, the company and the authorities were slow to provide updates uh, in the ensuing phases of the, uh, of the risk. Um, and uh, uh, although the public kept on stating their concerns about potential health risks, and uh, risks on the environment, they, they weren't responsive. So several years on, they're still not responsive about what, what went on. Although the public is reporting many consequences like dead fish in the water uh, and, and uh, other sort of uh, results of the, of the accident. And then the information provided by the company and the authorities was often conflicting and it was conflicting between the authorities themselves. So certain local authorities would uh, give a different um, uh, information to national authorities. And finally, the information provided was, uh, uh, when it was provided, it was technical and aimed to distract from, from uh, the attention from the, uh, from, from the real risks and it wasn't accessible to those that really needed to have the information in order to make an informed decision about their life and how they should behave in this new environment that was now um, that was now contaminated by the oil spill. So these are two examples of uh, of uh, uh, negative or let's say absent environmental risk communication. I mean the two uh, main differences between uh, the uh, examples of, let's say, successful or effective environmental risk communication and the ineffective ones is the, is the scale of the risk. So uh, they're not really comparable cases. Uh, we're talking about a nuclear disaster and a oil spill. In the, in the latter case and in the former, we, we spoke about, you know, air quality in schools in environments which are not really that affected by air pollution. So uh, so, uh, uh, I would say in order to assess, I, I don't know, I cannot, I couldn't think of any examples of actual positive, effective environmental risk communication. Um, we can, we, of course, we spent a large part of the uh, the lecture talking about the theoretical aspects of what needs to happen, but I couldn't think out of hand of examples of a, of a, of an effective environmental risk communication campaign. Okay, there's a question. Look at an example from Serbia. Politicians are putting blame regarding the air pollution on ordinary people, but even so, not educating them about what they can do differently to help have clean air. And of course, not even mentioning what the country itself is doing wrong. Exactly. I mean, uh, air pollution. I was going to include air pollution as an example because it is a it, it is a environmental risk affecting many cities across the region, and uh, uh, it is a. I mean, if we look at if we go back to the let's say first slide, where the where the uh, where the integrated system <clears throat> is presented. So risk communication system strategy. A standard operating procedure simulation. So first, to have a, a, a environmental risk strategy, uh, as we said, you need political will. So in all of these countries uh, across the region, there is no political will to be addressing uh, air pollution. Uh, once there is political will, we can start talking about, you know, determining what are the causes of air pollution. Then uh, the strategy, uh, then about the internal and the internal part then uh, the next step would be to determine which would be the specific institutions responsible for uh, for 
uh, implementing an environmental risk uh, communication. So would it be a minister, the Ministry of Health, would it be the Ministry of Environment, would it be uh, a combination of different departments that are looking at this specific issue? Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, how would it would combine international, national, local level, and then how it would be communicated to the, to the public. But, Overall, in the background, we, we need to have the political will for, for any sort of successful environmental risk communication. You emphasize, okay, Mladen, you emphasize the need to be clear in campaigns, but on the other hand, the audience is often uneducated where to draw the line and simplifying messages without lying. Um, you, of course, it's a, uh, it, it, it is a challenge always, uh, that's the role of good communicators. I mean, it's not the case only for risk communication. It is. Uh, it becomes all the more important to be very good at communicating with different audiences uh, when it comes to risk. So you create, uh, as you usually would with communications campaigns, seg segmented analysis of the different targets, uh, and then. Some would uh, some would require a certain uh, level of messaging in certain channels. Other would require different types of messages. Simplifying messages doesn't mean that you're reducing, removing the science. You just the language is maybe simpler. So uh, you always connect the message that you're trying to send with the end goal of the campaign. Is the end goal of the campaign um, to avoid specific risks? To to uh, uh, make sure that specific local populations in uh, affected areas are aware of the risk, then you have to simplify. If, if you're talking about uh, populations that are not really read, uh, literate, then you, you have to find other ways of uh, communicating with them. Uh, you, but definitely not lying. I mean, simplifying the messages is, not, is definitely not lying. What was your opinion on how the Ministry of Public Health and Republic of Macedonia led the ERC for the COVID-19 pandemic and the former minister role in it as a spokesperson? Um, I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic, as I said, uh, uh, these sort of pandemic situations are international challenges. So uh, you, you cannot really determine the level of risk, especially at the, out, at the outset, uh, in the national boundaries, so uh, in, the, in the national border. So uh, it, it, it's, it's really complicated uh, because it requires, let's say, interaction between national authorities, international authorities, then communication between the ministry and the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the country. So um, uh, I would say I mean, I would say that the focus was perhaps more on uh, on the communication rather than the science aspect. So trying to portray the spe a specific institution as engaging uh, actively, but for the purpose of engaging actively and not for the purpose of really uh, mitigating the risks for the public. So that's why we resulted, we had many many uh, actions which did not respond, uh, which, which turned out to be illogical several, let's say, months later or several years later. So, for instance, we had the quarantine for, for three or four days where um, uh, actions such as this. And then, uh, then we had, uh, at the same time, uh, no action in terms of improvements in the preparedness of public of the public health care as a whole. So if the Ministry of Public Health really was, um, uh, if the Ministry of Public Health uh, learned something from that situation, then they would, uh, uh, they would, they would be putting, let's say, standard operating procedures in place and investing in better health, public health care, better, better uh, preparedness um, to deal with future pandemics. But I don't think that is the case. And also there was in, in that situation, and it's not only in our case, it's the 
case with many countries across the world, there was also inconsistency of the messages, amplification of um, infodemics. Uh, so, um, I would say um, it, of course, we have to, we, when we assess it, it should be in the context of the challenge, of the risk, but also uh, in terms of uh, how, what, what lessons should, were learned then, it, they should be applied for, for, an, for a next uh, pandemic. So, and I'm not sure if that is really the case. If, 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 um, if any assessments are done internally in the institutions or any steps are taken uh, to be better prepared in the future. Okay, so assignments. Uh, the assignment for this week, uh, it's not, it's a quite, a, I think it's a quite a simple assignment um, and that, that was done on purpose because uh, um, um, it's quite, I mean, the aim is to be, don't spend too much time uh, reading about this or trying to find sources. Think about it from, you know, from the perspective of communicators that are trying to find a commonsensical way to respond to a specific situation. So more brainstorming, uh, less, let's say, reading. And I mean, you can refer to the materials online, but uh, try to think creatively about uh, a, a possible situation. So um, first of all, you need to answer each of these questions. So that gives you the structure already. And I don't think it will be more than, let's say, one page, A4. Um, so you will need to select an example of an environmental risk in the region. And it can be either something that has already occurred or for which there is a risk to occur in the future. So it can be, and it can also be something that is acute or chronic, like chronic would be air pollution and uh, acute is something like a chemical spill or, uh, or something that happens relatively quickly and requires a very swift response by the authorities. Uh, so you first choose the, an example of environmental risk then you select an example of a specific public institution on whose behalf you are this public institution and on, on the behalf of this institution you will need to devise uh, uh, you will need to devise an uh, effective environmental risk uh, I am on the last slide 21 uh, the assignment it says so So first environmental risk, then the public institution that you are, you are representing for the sake of this assignment. And then you will need to answer each of these following questions. First, what are the objectives of your environmental risk communication campaign? What are you trying to achieve? Uh, then which of the features of good environmental risk communication, uh, which we discussed in, in the negative context, uh, with the Japanese and the uh, US uh, case studies. So how does your campaign address each or some of these features? So you don't have to account for each of them, uh, but the more you account for, the better. So how does uh, uh, your campaign uh, make sure that it is transparent? So think of ways in which you make sure that you're transparent. Um, Let's say you, you openly post uh, about both the risks, but also the uncertainty that you have about the specific situation. <clears throat> then clarity, how do you make sure that your messages are clear? <clears throat> and it can be uh, theoretical and it can be, you can, you can just, you can, you can uh, be theoretical or you can provide specific content. So you can think of, you know, uh, depending on the environmental risk you've chosen, you can think of, I don't know, for instance, maybe there is an influencer that you have in mind uh, that you can use and that will help your accessibility. So then you can give that example or you can say, uh, in that case, we will use an influencer from the region or from that country or from that local community or 
then consistency. How do you make sure that uh, the, the communication is consistent? So um, uh, what steps you will take to ensure that it is consistent? For instance, you will speak with the various other authorities, uh, you will coordinate about who communicates when, what. Oh, okay, great. Now you can use camera and microphone to ask questions. You can, I, I, I mean, you, if you want to be concrete, you can use very specific examples, but you don't have to. You can be also theoretical. It's a very simple assignment and don't, you know, overthink it. Uh, uh, and then Finally, the last question would be, what would be the obstacles that might stand in the way of the success effectiveness of your environmental risk communication campaign? So to be honest about what, uh, why it might not be, uh, why you might not be able to achieve the, objective you, the objectives you set out to achieve from the outset. And when you are addressing each of these transparency, clarity, relevance, timeliness, you can be open and say we might not be able to be timely or we might not be able to be credible because the institution we've chosen, uh, let's say you choose Ministry of, I don't know, transport or from uh, the Macedonian Ministry of Transport and then you can say, oh, because we're, there might be a challenge with credibility because of the past uh, record. So, um, and then how do you address this credibility challenge? Do you approach another institution that is more credible to amplify the credibility of your message? How do you ensure that you're responsive to the public? Uh, where do you hear the message that they're sending you? You're listening on social media, you're maybe doing a survey, a quick survey, or you do focus groups in the specific local area to see what, uh, what are their concerns. So, Please ask me if it's uh, clear or if it's too abstract. Uh, but the idea is that once you start answering, you think of the environmental risk, then it becomes simpler to, to imagine how you would uh, you would start constructing this. Uh, and you can uh, and you can basically think of a scenario where the risk you're either anticipating a risk. Uh, so you are making this sort of anticipation scenario, how you would respond to it, or the risk is happening right now and you're responding to it um, as it as it uh, as it uh, as it has occurred. Uh, questions? Is the assignment clear? We have Trogovskagora situation between uh, hazardous. Okay, great. With uh, Trogovskagora situation between Bih and uh, uh, Croatia with hazardous materials disposal. Okay, uh, then you need to think uh, would it be a public institution uh, that is uh, cross country? Is it an inst or you, you choose the institution? You choose an institution from each country and then you create some sort of a coordinating body between the two. Okay, the ministry. Okay, which ministry would that be? The um, environment, for environment? So when you... There is no situation but it will be one. Okay, yeah, so, uh, yeah, of course, you, you uh, uh, this is an example of environmental risk, and in the description you can say why it is an environmental risk and what sort of population it will be affecting. So a short description of the environmental risk and why it is an environmental risk. Uh, it, I mean, not just paying attention to the environmental aspect, but let's say if there is a health, uh, why it is a hazardous 
uh, why are the materials hazardous? So write some uh, in in a little bit more detail what is the risk, and then the institution, and then what are the objectives of the environmental risk communication campaign. So you are so you are you are the uh, the assumption the assumption under which you are working is that there is a high political will. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Trade and Economic Relations. So the assumption under which you, you write this assignment is that there is a high political will to, um, uh, to communicate about this as openly and in the, in the, in the best possible way. So you, uh, you want to do a text, textbook example of, of good environmental risk communication. In an ideal scenario, how you would communicate about this? So the other, I mean, that's why uh, how I presented these examples. Uh, I will uh, upload, I think there is a option to upload the presentation. So you can, I mean, you can use this negative examples and try to avoid uh, Try to avoid that in your in your case study. So you write down case study and you write down description, quick description of um, the risk and why why it is a risk to the local population or the national or regional, and then go through each of these. Uh, I mean, the more you respond to the paper, but you don't have to if it's not possible. And Croatia did an assessment on this matter, so it could be useful for you if you decide to do this topic. Yeah. You didn't see any slide. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Definitely, I will upload it right after this. So if you have any questions uh, about the assignment, Please, I will be following the forum. But as I said, uh, it's um, be like uh, think about it. Let's say uh, creatively and uh, based on your experience and your uh, not just as communicators or whatever your background is. Based on let's say people living in a region that is affected by specific risks, think about how you would, what you would want in terms of transparency, clarity, relevance. Okay. Um, any other questions? I mean, on the one hand, it's a very simple assignment. On the other one, on the other hand, it's quite a complicated assignment. But I don't want to. It's not. Uh, it, it is complicated in the sense that um, it is very, very difficult to put in practice uh, everything that theoretically should uh, should uh, to, to to account for all the elements of a of a of a good environmental risk uh, communication campaign. So. Do we need to include information about a company or public? It should be a public institution. We should. We also should have some introduction. Uh, you don't need a conclusion. You you just need an introduction, like an outline of the of the risk, an outline of the institution, a uh, quick outline of the institution responsible, and make sure it is a public institution and not a company. Um, and then you can go through. Uh, I mean, if you want. As a, you, you can also have a very, very brief conclusion, but this should be A4, one page A4 in total. So it's not a large assignment where you write like a whole report about the various aspects. It's something, you know, you address in very briefly, uh, all of, in one or two sentences, three sentences at most, the uh, risk, the institution, and these uh, aspects, transparency, clarity, relevance, timeliness, credibility, responsive, consistency, accessibility. OK, any other questions? If not, great, clear, all clear. OK, great. Thank you. Uh,
I, I, as I said, I uploaded those links if you want to uh, uh, if you want to check out the examples uh, from East Palestine. So, yeah, thank you all for your attention. Uh, I look forward to receiving your uh, assignment. Uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Good night.